by your own hand Pearls ever on around the sun The seasons march at your command The old departs, the new year comes And though celestial is your gaze You search and care for all our Guide us through each day. Oh, how we want to follow you. Come, living way, our way may clear. Let perfect love drive out our. the sun once kissed whose beauty passed behind the clouds and all our fond and longing tears remind us we are pilgrims here we trust you sovereign of our years with all of our tomorrow Friends, welcome to another opportunity that we have here at Downsview Baptist Church to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of all creation, the one who has come to indeed incarnate himself to save his people from their sins. Again, we're glad that we have the opportunity to connect, not in person, albeit, but nevertheless in God's sovereign providence. He's provided us the way of technology that we can still connect together to honor our Lord Jesus. Just before we have our call to worship, let me offer a few announcements for the church, as well as two ministry opportunities 
to remind you to be praying for. We do, when we gather, need you to please reserve your seat in advance. And I mention this each week. The fact is that, that uh, we still need some of you to be kind enough to take the effort to do that as you come. And if you're not coming, to let us know you're not coming if you have a permanent seat already reserved. It's helpful to do that through downsviewbaptistchurch.com at our website. And that's helpful for Catherine and Florence. If you do that in advance, friends, because it helps with limiting our physical interaction and contact on Sunday morning and also just helps with the organization of the service so that we know and you know that there's a place for you all set and reserved when you come on a Sunday morning. So please keep that in mind if you would. You know, Emmy Bassa, who is our treasurer here at the church, has asked me to give a special note of thanks. And so I'm glad to begin our service with a note of this gratitude today with respect to our giving at the church. As our year has wrapped up, Emmy's been very encouraged at how you've understood that it's your faithful giving that funds the ministry at Downsview Baptist Church. So I add my voice to hers in extending our appreciation to you. As you know, you can drop your offering off here at the church during our services or in the mail or in the mailbox during the week even. But the online giving or Interact e-transfer system has really proven helpful for folks. And so again, thank you for doing that. We do appreciate that very much. One change that's happening to one of our ministries in the next little while is our prayer meeting, which was already on Wednesday evenings and we moved it to Wednesday mornings to make it easier accessible to those who come. We're going to make another move and make it more accessible but online for the next three or four Wednesdays at least. We just thought it prudent and wise that given the folks who come to our church service at at least on the prayer meeting on Wednesdays or at uh, 11 in the morning, we're going to go on Zoom. So look for the daily semi-daily semi -daily emails, that uh, videos and emails that I send out to you. And you'll find on there the link for the Zoom meeting that will still be, as we say, at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. And so, you know, it might even be helpful for some of you to join with us because if you don't have the time to come all the way over to the church or it's not the easiest way to get over here, perhaps just open your phone or your laptop, maybe even during work at, at your lunch break or something like that. You can come and just pop on. And even if you can only stay for a little while, come pray with us. Come let us know what we can pray for you for and to dive into our devotional time around the word of God. So prayer meeting Wednesdays, same time at 11 online on Zoom until essentially further notice is the best way to think of it. Again, I thank God for moving Diane Taylor to move us to spend the next year reading the Bible through. And to do that with the ESV reading plan that we've used, thank you for so many of you who've been so encouraging to us that it's a good move and a good idea. Essentially, friends, we just want people to be intaking the Word of God and to be immersing themselves in the truth of the Word of God throughout this next year. Now, frankly, you can just grab your Bible and read four chapters a day, and you'll probably be just about through the Bible in a year. That's an approximate uh, way you can go about that. But if you'd like some structured help, go to esv.com, and you can subscribe to the daily reading plan, and it'll come right to your email box. And every morning you just open it up and there's the four or five chapters, take you about 15, 18 minutes to read through it each day. And you can just do that and follow along. If you'd like some help, like I like to have it done audibly, podbean.com, that's the app, which is the audio app. And you can just subscribe there to the ESV in one year. And each day it will come up on your phone. You click on that and you can listen to it on your way into work. You can listen to it on your way home from work. You can listen to it personally as you're having your lunch, perhaps. You might even use it in accordance with or connection to the actual scriptures themselves. And you can read along as someone reads to you, like we do on Sunday mornings when we read our scripture text. I encourage you to open your Bibles and listen as it's, it's read. And so however you choose to do that, brothers and sisters, we're glad that God is moving us as a church family to be more conformed to his image by means and the means that Jesus prayed we would be. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. That was Jesus' prayer for you and I the night before he died. 
He wanted us to come into God's presence more easily and to be conformed to the image of our heavenly king more fully by means of his word. Friends, don't think for a moment that any of us don't have time to do this. 15 minutes a day, man alive. Of course we have that much time. It's a wonderful way to do it. This reading plan will take you through a little section of Genesis, the Psalms, and the Gospel of Matthew. That's where we're beginning now. So you get a little flavor of different portions and different styles of the writing of the uh, Old and New Testament scriptures. I just want to encourage you, friends, if you haven't started yet, it's not too late. Just jump on in, either where we are already, or back up and get up to speed, or frankly, just jump in wherever you're at and bring the word of God to bear upon your heart and your family's life. Two ministry partnerships that I want to encourage us to pray for. We mentioned Feb Central very often. I'm not sure that I mention it enough and encourage you to pray for it. This is our denomination or our fellowship of churches. We have almost 300 churches with the churches throughout our region, which includes Ontario and the Anglophone Church in the province of Quebec. Just about a year and a half ago, we received the blessing of God by bringing, after a decade of fine leadership by Bob Fleming, now Dr. Rick Buck is our regional director. Rick was the pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church up in Barrie for 26 plus years and been in ministry itself for over 30 years. And God moved him to leave that pastorate and to help bring a pastoral sensitivity and wise leadership vision to our fellowship of churches. We're really grateful as Rick oversees the three key areas that Fed Central seeks to major in. That is leadership development, church health, and church planting. And so I want to encourage you to keep Rick in mind and in your prayers as he oversees all of the staff and the direction, many of which are some new initiatives in terms of the family of churches that we belong to. The other ministry partnership that we have is with Heritage College and Seminary. And Heritage College and Seminary, you may recall, is connected to us through Godfrey Thorogood. Now, Godfrey Thorogood used to work for Feb Central in leadership development. Now he is a director of partner initiatives for Heritage. And Heritage, of course, is the seminary. It's our seminary. We don't own it or direct it, but we have significant influence there and significant attachment to it. Godfrey Thorogood that I mentioned brought a, a note of thanksgiving to us just around Christmas time, a video that he brought, uh, whereas he works under President Rick Reed. Rick Reed came about a decade or more ago uh, to take up the helm and the, the reins at Heritage, as it were, after a number of years at pastoring the Met Church in Ottawa, a relatively large and significant church. The thing about Heritage is that as a pastor, I want to know that I can unapologetically, unashamedly, and without hesitation recommend young people to go and to be equipped with the truth of the gospel and to be empowered to minister the truth of that gospel in vocational ministry settings. And I'm very grateful that we unashamedly, unapologetically, and without hesitation uh, recommend and are grateful for the partnership we have with Heritage. And so if you keep those two things in mind, both Feb Central and Heritage College and Seminary, Rick Bach and Dr. Rick Reed, we'd appreciate if you'd continue to keep them in your prayers. I encourage you to take your Bibles at this time and turn to the book of Psalms. Now, as I'm holding up my Bible, you can see that the book of Psalms is approximately in the center of your Bible. And so if we were here together, I would tell you the page number. If you just open your Bible to the middle of it, you'll find the book of Psalms, which is essentially the book of praises. This is basically the, the Hebrew hymn book uh, before this yeah, before we had other things that started to replace more of that. But the fact is that these book, this book of Psalm and these what are contained in here are the way that God encouraged his people to praise him. And so we do that this morning with Psalm 25 and we ask God to draw us closer to him through his word beginning at verse 4. Let's hear the word of the Lord together. The psalmist prays, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me because or for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. 
Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts and minds in prayer before you in a submissive posture, as it were, of bowing before you, acknowledging your lordship, you who are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the one who, dear God, has sent your son into this world, that he, living a perfectly righteous life, would do so in the place of sinners like me, hanging on the cross to die a perfectly efficacious death on our behalf. We praise you for that. And so we come to you in his name today, asking that this service would be a blessing to your people and an honor to your name. We ask this with thanksgiving for all that you've done in light of your steadfast love and your goodness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Tidy for me cause his pain for me who am to death pursue amazing love how can it be that thou my God I should die for me amazing love how can it be that thou just die for me He left his father's throne above So free, so infinite his grace Emptied himself Brothers and sisters, I want to offer a special announcement this morning and have it read into the record of our church here. 
And it's specifically with respect to the issue of Bill C-4 that was proposed by, moved by the Honorable David Lametti, who is the Federal Minister of Justice. A new law that has just come into effect this past Friday that is connected to the issue of conversion therapy and the bill called Bill C-4. Now, a number of you have surely heard about this. This bill has created a great deal of concern in the evangelical community in our country. And our national fellowship has encouraged us, along with a number of other churches, to confirm and affirm and reaffirm our commitment to a biblical view of sexuality and gender. Now, I am no lawyer. I'm not one who understands these things. And so I'm going to read to you some details, both from Paul Carter, who is the pastor of Cornerstone Church up in Orillia, one of our newest Feb churches, as well as a statement from the pastor of the Met Church in Ottawa, uh, Jonathan Griffiths, who is part of the Religious Freedom Summit and has created a document that thousands of our churches across our land are reading this morning into their church services. And so I encourage you to continue to be in prayer both for our fellowship and for our Union of Churches, the Gospel Coalition in Canada, as these statements are read out in a number of our churches this morning. Paul Carter writes this. Now, on January 7th, Bill C-4 has become the law of the land. Now, this brief summary has been created to serve the end that we would understand a summary, but it would not be construed as any kind of legal counsel. A similar bill, known as Bill C-6, was first introduced in October 2020 and was last discussed in the end of the 43rd Parliament, which ended, as you may recall, on August 2021. The concern of that bill that was raised was the definition of conversion therapy that was actually contained in that bill, which was considered by many to be exceedingly broad. The definition set out the bill is as set out in the bill is as follows. Any practice treatment or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, to change a person's gender identity or gender expression to cisgender, cisgender means one single gender, or to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior or non-cisgender gender expression. Now, the effort to pass the bill was ultimately set, in, set aside in September 20th, 2021, as our Prime Minister called a federal election. Now, although the election did not significantly strengthen the Prime Minister's hand, Bill C-4, an expanded version of C-6, passed through the entire parliamentary process, including affirmation by the Senate, on Tuesday, December the 7th, without one single dissenting vote. It received royal assent on December 8th and has become law, as we said, just this past Friday, January 7th. The definition of conversion therapy is very similar to the definition in Bill C-6, though expanded so as to expressly forbid practices, treatments, or services designed to change or repress a person's gender expression to align with their biological sex. In 2020, the Gospel Coalition Canada asked the Parliamentary Committee to clarify the definition of conversion therapy in association with Bill C-6. The concern was that the overly broad definition could lead to conversations between parents and children or between pastors and congregants actually being criminalized. We further, the Gospel Coalition Committee, asked the committee to clarify specifically what is meant by the terms practice, treatments, or services. The wording of Bill 4, Bill C-4, provided no such clarification. And such it remains unclear to pastors, to parents, to counselors and mentors, how these terms ought to be understood. Now, assurances by lawmakers have been provided to constituents that the bill only seeks to criminalize coercive efforts and coercive practices, treatments, and services, and that the bill would not apply to a person who sought out a pastor or mentor for help to live a chaste sexual lifestyle or to live in alignment with their biological sex. However, 
No such assurances appear in the language of the actual bill. Regardless of the concern expressed by many, this past Friday, Bill C-4 is now the law of the land. And the precise application of this law at this point is still unclear. It's possible that pastors and counselors may find themselves harassed by overzealous law enforcement personnel and crown prosecutors, at which point the matter will enter the legal system, possibly making its way all the way to the Supreme Court, where the appropriate limits and application of Bill C-4 Bill C will be formally adjudicated. There are many legal experts, Christians and otherwise, were actually surprised by the language adopted by the bill. It does appear to overreach the line established clearly in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In our legal system here in Canada, charter rights are considered supreme rights, against which no law can be made. The charter identifies freedom of religion, freedom of thought, opinion, expression, even media communication as fundamental freedoms. Now, there are a number of responses being planned by churches across Canada today. The one that we are reading here today is by the Canadian Religious Freedom Summit. In this initiative, pastors are encouraged to read this following statement today across our land. And as I said, our national fellowship has encouraged us as a Feb Church to read it as well. And so now I'm about to read the contents that comes from the Canadian Religious Freedom Summit. Quote, this past week marked a monumental change in Canadian law and society with the enactment of Federal Bill C-4, which amends the criminal code. The law's stated purpose is to outlaw conversion therapy. Now we strongly oppose the coercive and unscientific therapeutic practices that the bill was introduced to address. We appreciate and affirm the desire of parliamentarians to protect the vulnerable. However, we are deeply concerned that the effective reach of the legislation could be extended far beyond its stated purpose. Because its definition of conversion therapy is vague, many are concerned that it could capture parents, pastors, and counselors who teach a biblical understanding of sexuality in a variety of situations. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees our freedoms of religion, conscience, thought, belief, expression, and association. It is our prayer that the law will be applied and clarified as needed in such a way as to honor these charter protections. We recognize that the greatest danger facing the Canadian church is not, is not that we might face criminal prosecution, but rather that we might compromise in our teaching of the word of God or fall silent in our proclamation of the gospel. Along with leaders of like conviction across Canada, we stand before you today to pledge that we are committed to obeying God above all others. See Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. With the Lord's help, we will continue to proclaim the whole counsel of God. See Acts chapter 20, verse 27. And we will do so without fear or favor. This includes God's life-giving design for human beings made in his image, male and female. See Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Made in his image, male and female, with sexual intimacy, reserved for the covenantal union of a man and a woman. See Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. We will continue to issue the call to repent of all kinds of sin and to believe the gospel, knowing that all have sinned, See Romans 3.23. And that salvation through Jesus is the one true hope of the world. See Acts chapter 4, verse 12. We will continue to love and serve all people in our community without distinction, 
in Jesus' name. As we press on in the work of ministry, we will trust our Heavenly Father to guard us and to keep us and to work out his great purposes for our good and for his glory. And lastly, we continue to pray for our government and to plead with the Lord to have mercy on our needy land. End quote. Back to Paul Carter's reflections. While I cannot speak for all pastors in Canada, I am, for one, hopeful that the church will not be drawn into any kind of adversarial posture towards the LGBTQ community. These are people created in the image and likeness of God that we are called to love and to treat with respect and dignity. I want to extend to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, which includes a sincere belief that the grace of God in Christ provides both forgiveness and the power to change. That is the same gospel that saved me and that continues to give me hope today. I am praying for the wise application of Bill C-4, such that abusive or coercive practices are forbidden while speaking the truth in love continues to be permitted. Nevertheless, Paul Carter mentions, I fully recognize that a day may well come when there is a heavy price to pay in this country for faithfully preaching what the Bible says about human sexuality and gender. If it comes, or when it comes, I pray that we will count it an honor to suffer on behalf of Christ. Until that time, and as long as the Lord gives us life and breath, we will continue to use every opportunity to reach out in love and gospel concern to our fellow Canadians. Friends, pray with me, please. Our God and Heavenly Father, times like this are so unique in our country, in our land, indeed in our churches. And so we pray this morning, dear God, that you would rain down grace upon this country of Canada. That we pray even as we sing in our national anthem, God, keep our land glorious and free. We might even pray, make it more glorious. Cause the freedom that there is in Christ to reign in this country. For all those, Heavenly Father, who are upset, concerned, confused, frustrated, angry, fearful, we pray, Heavenly Father, that your grace would overwhelm each heart and that the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sovereign truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's been sent into this world to perfectly represent, it, to represent a sinner like me, living a perfectly righteous life before his heavenly father on my behalf and then perfectly paying my debt incurred by not living that life, perfectly paying that debt on the cross in my place, that that truth of that gospel would indeed empower us for salvation and equip us that we might change all the more into your image, specifically with respect to this issue of conversion therapy, with the confusion around biblical sexuality and gender, I pray for gospel clarity to reign in our church, particularly here in Feb Central and across our nation, Feb National, but also for the AGC, the BGC, other like-minded churches that I know are committed to this this morning. We ask Heavenly Father that together we would be your people and that you would be pleased to use your grace in a powerful, even amazing way to shape this world for the glory of Christ. We humbly ask your help, for courage, and for clarity. In Christ's name, amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you at this time, as we come to our time of devotion around the Word of God, to please take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. If we were here in person, you see where the page number is, but it's just after 1st and 2nd Corinthians and just before Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians chapter 2, as you recall, is the continuation of what we began last Sunday. 
we have returned to our series, which we began some time ago, over two months ago now, almost three months ago. And so I thought it wise that last week we began a bit of a review of where we were to bring ourselves back up to speed. We talked last time about some of the details about the heart of the gospel and where it is that we are to be boasting, and that is only in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, as chapter 6 and verse 14 summarizes, I believe, the entire intent and call for us of the entire book. Galatians chapter 2 today speaks about not only the fact that we want that gospel to be proclaimed, protected, prized so deeply that it would be preserved for us, but why is it? And how is it? And where do we find the temptation to add to the purity of the gospel, which, of course, pollutes the gospel itself. What, where are those temptations? Why is there a temptation to do that? And how might we, as a church at Downsview, be equipped against that kind of pollution? We're going to begin by reading chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And I will be reading off the screen uh, for the sake of the video but I encourage you to pick up where we left off last week. The Apostle Paul, of course, has been giving essentially his ministry testimony, his missionary ministry testimony through the last half of chapter one about where he went and where he was influenced or where, in fact, he was actually not influenced. And you'll see some of those details come out today. But he begins in chapter two that after some 14 years, and that's either since his conversion or since his last mission, missionary effort. It's a little bit murky on the timeline there. But after quite some time, he finally comes to home base in Jerusalem. That's where we pick it up, chapter 2 and verse 1. So the Apostle Paul says, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and taking Titus along with me. Now, I went up because of a revelation and set before them though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim amongst the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. And yet... Because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery? To them, we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, now, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when John and Cephas, or excuse me, James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, when they perceived the grace that was given me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to me. That we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised only. They asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. Father, for your help, I humbly ask, I, I plead with you, dear God, that your spirit would override all of my weaknesses, all of my insecurities, all of my own lack of holiness, and that your spirit would work as one commentator said, to now make beautiful music from a broken instrument. You can do all things, dear God. We have every expectation of your grace now. And so we ask for it through Christ. Amen. 
And so last Sunday, friends, we saw that the intention of this book is to lay out both the sufficient and efficient work of Christ. That Christ is sufficient, that all that we require to be saved and sanctified comes through Jesus. And that that sufficiency has actually been worked out, that it's efficient, that it's actually had an effect on our lives, that Christ, the efficient work of Christ is done because of the sufficiency of Christ himself. And we saw that there was this call that the gospel, the glory of Christ seen in the gospel, would be proclaimed with clarity, would be protected with vigilance, would be prized with great heart affection so that the gospel would be preserved for those in Galatia. Chapter 2 and verse 5, that's his point there in particular, that we do not want people to come into or bring us into slavery. We would not yield in submission to anything being added to the gospel so that, in order that, it might be preserved. Preserved in its purity. Preserved in its potency. That it might be indeed preserved for those at Galatia. And it's very important that we understand that it would be preserved in that purity, not destroyed by distortion. We mentioned that last week that Timothy Keller reminded us that gospel revision is gospel reversal. That where it's revised, it's reversed. Its effect is not to help people and glorify God, but it's actually reversed into something that is man-centered and no longer accomplishing God's purposes, but where it's distorted, where it's, it's polluted, it's actually polluted not only in just its essence, but in its effectiveness. And Paul doesn't want that. And the interesting aspect of this is, well, again, how is something not preserved for you? We recognize that purity is always polluted by adding something to it. We mentioned about the fly in the ointment or the, you know, I've got a fly in my soup or I've got a bug on my plate. You just think there's, it's very little effect to what's actually going on, but it's so repulsive to us. And we ought to be repulsed when anyone for any reason ever wants to add to the purity of the gospel because adding something to that which is already pure simply pollutes it. I think most of you know an easy example of, of steel that when steel is used in construction and such, it's not mined pure form. It's not as if you go to a steel mine. No, no, you go to an iron ore mine. You add carbon to it, sometimes adding other elements as copper and such, depending on the uh, integrity that you're looking for from that piece of steel. But you put things together and now it's something new. And some, it's actually, in this case, something better. When we have steel that's actually stronger than iron would be on its own. That's a good effect of adding to something. What we're concerned, though, is the opposite of that. Is that when you add just a little something that's not exactly right, that's not true, that's simply not what the gospel is, when anything else, even good intentions, are added or added because of good intentions, the gospel itself is polluted. And it's not better, it's not stronger, it's worse. It's adding something that actually takes away the potency of the gospel and its own effect. You see, some are seeking to pollute the gospel in Galatia by adding the works of the law. That was the issue. That was where the attack was. People that are called Judaizers, that essentially are saying you must be a Jew before you can legitimately be a Christian. That's where the gospel was under attack. That's where it was being polluted. That's who it was. That's the, the, the who. And interestingly enough, the who that Paul uses as an example that that's not the case is his friend Titus. That he says in chapter 2 and verse 1 that he took Titus along with him and down in verse 3 even Titus who was with me was not forced to be circumcised that's the issue that was the particular application of the old covenant law that was trying to be applied to the gospel 
that in order to be a Christian, you must be circumcised in conformity to the Old Testament law. Essentially, a Gentile had to first become a Jew in order to become a Christian. You could not be a Christian without first passing through some of the rituals of the good Old Testament law, but a misapplication, obviously, of that. It's as if they were saying faith in Christ plus the works of the law equals Christianity. That's how you become a Christian. And the Apostle Paul is very concerned that this would not be something that would take place. No, that's not how it works. We do not add faith in Christ plus anything to become a Christian. That's just not how it works. The Apostle Paul is very clear that adding anything to the gospel pollutes the gospel's purity. Polluting the gospel's purity is an assault on its preservation. See, that's why it matters to us. Because the, the initiative in chapter 2 and verse 5 is so that the gospel would be preserved for you. And, and adding something to it pollutes it, and polluting it is an assault on the actual preservation that Paul is so eager that that would be the case at Galatia chapter 2 and verse 5. And therefore, an assault on the preservation of the gospel is ultimately an assault on the sufficient and efficient work of the or person and the work of that person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he is so concerned about this. See, he tells them in chapter 2 and verse 7 that when, we, when they saw, when those at Jerusalem, and we'll get to the details here, when they saw that he had been entrusted with the gospel. That's the issue. He and we have been entrusted with an expectation from God himself that he has, as he has given us the truth of his gospel through his word, as he has given that to us and trusted that with us, to us, to the church, that we indeed would be seeking and working and protecting and contending for the purity of the gospel such that it might be preserved. And those who have been entrusted with the gospel are indeed entrusted to preserve its purity. That's the interest. That's the issue. That preserved in purity. Not just preserved in some form, but preserved in the form that we've actually received it. We would do that by prizing it so deeply that we would protect it so vigilantly that we would see that it is proclaimed with this kind of clarity. When we said that, I'm wanting to apply this this morning, friends, to us as a church family and ask some of these application questions. Because I think for the most part, up to this point, we're all saying, yeah, of course we get that. We're, we want the gospel to be preserved in the form that Jesus has given it to us. This question, where does the temptation to add to it come from? Why? Are these folks at Galatia, who had infiltrated even the church at Jerusalem, and the Apostle Paul is reporting back to the church at Galatia about his interactions in Jerusalem and using these interactions as an example for them in the Galatian churches in this province of Galatia. Where does that temptation come from? Why would anyone want to do that? And I'm suggesting, friends, that there are at least three temptations that come to us in terms of why we would ever want to add anything to the gospel that we would be tempted to alter the gospel, to pollute the gospel so that we could reach others with it, so that we could unite others in it, and so that we could care for others by it. All good things, wouldn't we agree? We want people to be reached with and united in and cared for by the gospel and because of the gospel and, and in response to the call of the gospel. Think of it this way. It's a good move with bad motives. It's a good move with bad motives. The alteration of the gospel so that more would be reached by it, so that a church should be united in it, so that people would actually be cared for because of it. To do any of those things by polluting the gospel so that that would happen better, good motives, bad move. Good motives, 
bad moves. Let, let, me, let me see if we can unpack each of those individually. In chapter 2 and verse 2 to 5, you actually see this thought. Recognize, please, downs you, recognize the temptation to add to the gospel in order that we might reach others with it. Think of it this way. Freedom from sin, which is the result and fruit of the gospel, freedom from sin does not lead to slavery to legalism. You see, the case here is that the Apostle Paul, when he received the gospel, was very clear back in chapter 1 and verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to me is not man's gospel. Verse 12, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you remember, perhaps, in the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul met the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected and reigning Lord Jesus Christ, on the road to Damascus. He was on his way to persecute Christians. And the Lord Jesus showed up. Why, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? And, and, and the Apostle Paul uh, began an incredible change of life at that point as God gripped him. And as he, he says, in fact, verse 15, But he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, who was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. Paul says, God changed me that day. And when he did that, he was aware that his Jewish brothers who hated these new people of the way, remember that's what it was called in Acts chapter 6, the way, I think in relation to Jesus' claim he was the way, the truth, and the life, that the Apostle Paul knew that his compatriots, ethnically Jewish people who hated this new Christianity just as he did, would believe that he just got this new idea from people. He had been influenced by the wrong crowd. And the Christians themselves would think, oh yeah, the Apostle Paul just got this from somewhere else. And so he knew this was going to be very difficult for him to have any credibility amongst his new Christian brethren or in terms of reaching those who were of the circumcision. Now he was called particularly to go to the uncircumcised, to the Gentiles as we know. But this is where he began and it was a, a bit of a struggle for him. And he knew that. And so he wanted to make clear early on that his authority had not come from men, had not come from a, a group of people that he had spoken of, but this is not man's gospel. This comes from God. And when I received it, I didn't immediately go to headquarters. He says, I didn't immediately consult with any man. In fact, he says, I didn't even go to Jerusalem until three years later, chapter 1, verse 18, and I was there visiting Cephas, or Peter, and remained with him 15 days. He spoke with Peter and he says, I spoke with the Lord's brother James. And then I left. Fourteen years later, I went. He had had a significant, impactful gospel ministry before he ever went to home base to say, now, what do you guys think? Because I got my authority and revelation of the gospel from God himself and I went and ministered proclaimed it, protected it, because I prize it so deeply. And now I want it preserved for you in Galatia. And he uses his example of his time in Jerusalem as an example for those to equip those in Galatia. So in chapter 2, as we're speaking about these people that he's talking to, remember, these are those that he interacted with back at headquarters, if you will, in Jerusalem. And some 14 years later, he goes... And he has a care for those who want to reach others with the gospel. And, and so his concern was that these Judaizers want to add to faith in Christ the issue of circumcision. So that people could be reached with the gospel. You know what that's like. You want to reach others with the gospel and there's aspects of their lives that you think may not live up at this moment to being a Christian. Haven't you ever found yourself struggling and saying that person's not, doesn't look much like a Christian? And if they did, if they acted more Christian-like, Christian if they started to use Christian lingo, if they started to dress like we think Christians should dress, if they talked and attended and served like Christians, then, then maybe they could become one. You, you belong before you be, before you become. 
It's just not how the gospel works. Christ Jesus has come into this world to save sinners. The doctor doesn't come to people without COVID. He comes to those with it. I didn't come to call those who are well but the sick. I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, Jesus said. We don't want non-Christians to act like Christians so that they'll become Christians. No, no, we want them to become Christians so that therefore after that, since they are Christians, that their lives would become into conformity with the expectation and dictates of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I'll tell you, it is all the difference in the world between these two statements. In order to be a Christian, you are obliged to do this. Versus, since you are a Christian, you are obliged to do this. Do you see the difference? It is all the difference in the world. In order to become a Christian, you must do this. Versus, since you are a Christian, you're obliged to do this. And the example he uses is Titus. And he says there that in verse 3, even Titus who was with me was not forced to be circumcised, even though he was uncircumcised. That's what he means by he was a Greek, he was a Gentile. And Paul certainly wants people to be reached with the gospel. And as those in, in Galatia, and in this particular time in Jerusalem, want other people to be reached for the gospel, he says, I went back to home base, and do you know what the gospel is there? Titus doesn't need to obey the Old Testament law to be reached with the gospel. He's one of us. He's part of the team. In fact, he actually uses that for Paul and Barnabas himself as well, doesn't he? That down in, in verse 9, when they saw, they perceived the grace that was given me. They gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles. Gentiles like whom? Like Titus who were part of us, who were part of the team. There was no opposition towards the legitimate Christianity and therefore gospel partnership of Titus. That's just not required. In order to be a Christian, Titus, you must do this. No, no. Since you are a Christian, there are certain expectations that Jesus does have for all of us. If you think of this at Downsview Baptist Church, it's not the issue of circumcision. It might be the issue of baptism. And if we want to come to people into their lives and say, when we saw folks being baptized in this tank a month or two ago, when they came up out of the water, did you find yourself saying, right, now she's a Christian? Or did you see them come up out of the water and say, now I see that she's a Christian? You see the difference? Now they're a Christian. No, no, no. Now I see it. Now it's affirmed. Now it's gloriously on display. Since you're a Christian, this is how you operate. This is what you must do. But friends, we will not add to the gospel. We will not pollute its purity and attack its preservation by suggesting that in order to reach people with the gospel, something else must be added, in particular, even the good works of a good law that came from a good God, that that would be used to show our own deficiencies and that we cannot do what God has called us to do and will bring us, therefore, to the throne of God above, to the feet of Christ, where we beg for repentance and forgiveness and conversion. And we trust Jesus. We believe him. And we come and we come to him. We come to him just as we are. With all our shortcomings and all our inabilities. All of the things that we cannot do, that we wish we could do. And Jesus accepts us when we have faith and trust in him. And from that point forward, from that point forward, having been reached with the gospel... Not adding to it, but being reached with the pure, preserved gospel. The truth of it has been entrusted to us. People come to Christ through that. They are reached that way. And then we seek to help them bring their lives into conformity to Christ. The first temptation is to change the gospel, to add the gospel, because we want to reach people with it. The second temptation comes because we want to unite people in it. And this is between verses 6 and 9. 
recognize the temptation to add to the gospel by wanting to unite people in it. It's this thought here. Freedom from sin does not lead to slavery to legalism. But secondly here, freedom of unity does not mean slavery to uniformity. Notice in verse 6. And from those who seem to be influential, these Judaizing influencers, these people who are the, you know, the big shots in Jerusalem who are infecting the church with this concern that the gospel should be changed to add the works of the law. Paul says, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. To those, I say, who seemed influential, they added nothing to me. There was no help. The God, people were not going to be united in this at all. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, look down at verse 9. When James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, pillars, perceived that the grace that was given me, perceived the grace given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me. Do you see that? It's the connection that since Titus and others like that have been reached, that the unity in the gospel with Barnabas and Paul, that they were united in the gospel with those in Jerusalem, did not require a sense of uniformity. I know that's becoming a bit of a slogan here, but hear that. So often we are going to think that we must add something to the gospel and lower the standard is often it, isn't it? So, well, we're all, we're all just the same. Nobody's any better. Nobody's any different. Oh, wait a minute. Someone might be better, even though we are equally the same as fallen people before the Lord. Other people grow different. Other people have different gifts. Other people have different levels of maturity. People grow at different speeds and intensity. Of course, someone might be better in the sense that they're more closely conformed, uh, conformed to the image of Christ than someone else. But that's not a problem with respect to our unity in the gospel. We're not freed, freed from slavery to, or freed from the sin of uh, slavery to sin so that we can now come into slavery to legalism. That was our first point. But the second point is we're not you know, the slavery of uniformity. Unity does not mean we're all going to be the same. And Paul is affirmed here. Look, we're going to go to the, you go to the Gentiles, in fact, is what he says the people at home base at Jerusalem told him to do. And they were going to focus on ethnically Jewish people. And yet they're united. The gospel does not need to be added to because, oh, I see. So everyone has to have the old covenant law applied to them to be circumcised so that we can be united in the gospel. No, no, no. Some have been circumcised before they came to Christ and some are not circumcised and now have come to Christ. The temptation to change the gospel, to pollute its purity, by asking everyone to be the same. It's a temptation that's real. And a temptation that cannot be given into. Not be given into, brothers and sisters. The concern to reach people with the gospel, to unite people in it, and thirdly, to care for them by it. This is as you see down in verse 10 in particular. That there's this thought that only they ask us to remember the poor. Paul says, it's the very thing that I was eager to do. You see, this freedom in Christ that we do have still means a duty to charity. Not a slavery to it, but a duty to love and to care for one another. Sometimes there's a sense that I better change the gospel to say, unless we are involved in the social gospel, in social justice, if we are not doing things out of acts of mercy, we can't become a Christian. No, no, no. That's, you don't add that to it. That's not part of the gospel. What it is, is a concern that we would be loving and taking care of each other. Yeah, that's what happens because we've received the gospel. It's not something that we change the gospel to mean. The preservation of the gospel preserves the unity of believers in this one true gospel, even as we care for each other. I know there can be a legitimate concern. How do we reach one another? One another with the gospel. How do we reach other people with the gospel? Well, we want to shift it and change it and add something to it. 
We want to be sure that we're all united. So there's some sense that we need to dumb it down and that everybody will just believe the lowest common denominator. There's some sense that we really want to care for people in the gospel and be equipped and empowered to do that. So we're going to add to that. Can't be a Christian unless you're doing these things. No, no, no. Since you're a Christian, we still have a duty. And that's what we do have a duty. To take care of each other in the gospel. Those less fortunate than us. And less fortunate is a sliding scale. Because that means people who are in need at different times and different seasons. Not just as their status in life from this point onward. There may be people who are the poor, as he refers to here in chapter 2 and verse 10. But there'll be people who have different needs at different times. We need to be perceptive to that. And we do need to apply that to be sure. But we never apply it as if we're actually changing the gospel itself. Because indeed our temptation to want to change it, to reach people with it, to unite us in it, to care for people by it. Nevertheless, as my buddy Andrew Hall at the Bible Church out in Ilderton mentions, he puts it this way, that Paul uses this independent apostolic authority, not man's gospel. He uses that authority to what? Call Jews and Gentiles together in Christ. Why? His authority, therefore, is upheld. But then the gospel is preserved and the unity of God's people is actually maintained without any change to the gospel itself. The preservation of the gospel which has been entrusted to us is our goal. Adding anything to the gospel actually does not help it. It blasphemes its author, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ itself. Living by faith for Christ is an extension of being saved by faith by Christ. That's how it works out. It's not part of the gospel. It's the fruit of living it out. And I pray that we at Downsview would understand that as we do want people to be reached, united, and cared for by the gospel, that we will guard our hearts against any temptation to add anything that might pollute its purity. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, help us as a church family to be gripped with the gospel, to seek to keep the gospel front and center in its absolute purity, and that we, I pray, Heavenly Father, would live it out amongst us, wanting to reach others with it, to be united as a church in it, and therefore to care for one another in love, that we would, as 1 Peter 1.23 reminds us, to love one another deeply from the heart, but that we would see again and again, dear God, that we must resist the temptation to believe that people can only be loved if the gospel is changed. The offense of the gospel, dear God, leads to an acceptance of the gospel. The offense of it shows us how we have fallen short and we come to the one true and living Savior that we would be received by him. And having been received by him, we'll be equipped to reach others with it, to be united as a church in it, and to care for one another by it. Thank you for these great truths this morning, Heavenly Father. We pray through Christ. Amen.